Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, news reporters know about the risks of working in countries at war. But the recent death or disappearance of three individuals in Turkey, Bulgaria, and Mexico showed the growing dangers to people targeted for their reporting. Turkish officials are searching for Jamal Khashoggi, who wrote commentaries for the Washington Post newspaper. He has not been seen since he entered Saudi Arabia's diplomatic office in Istanbul last week. Some believe that he might have been killed there because he had written critically of the Saudi government. The government says the claim is baseless. Khashoggi went to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to get documents he needed to get married. He had lived in the United States and was trying to become a U.S. citizen. His fiance has called on President Donald Trump to help find him. Separately, Bulgarian National Radio reported an arrest Tuesday in the death of television broadcaster Victoria Maranova. In her reporting, she accused a Bulgarian building company of misusing money provided by the European Union. Bulgarian police say the murder does not appear to be linked to her reporting. In Mexico this past week, journalist and activist Sergio Martinez Gonzalez was shot and killed as he ate with his wife. Two people on a motorcycle are the suspected killers. The Committee to Protect Journalists reports that 43 journalists have been killed in 2018. There were 46 deaths for all of 2017. The numbers are not unusual. More than 73 journalists were killed in 2015. What is different is the way they are being killed. At least 27 journalists have been individually targeted so far this year. Eight lost their lives in violent conflicts. The CPJ said, of all the media workers killed since 1992, 848 were individually killed and 1,322 were lost in war or other violence. Just as shocking is the spread of killings into Europe. In addition to Maranova's death in Bulgaria, Jan Kuciak was found shot to death in Slovakia after investigating tax corruption among people close to the government. In Malta, investigative reporter Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed after reporting on government corruption for her blog. There are crooks everywhere you look now, she wrote right before her death. The killing of five employees at the Capital Gazette newspaper in Maryland by a gunman in June showed the threat exists in the United States. In addition, the United Nations is seeking the release of two jailed Reuters news agency reporters in Myanmar. Walon and Cha Sou had been investigating the killing of ten Rohingya Muslim men and boys. Bruce Shapiro is with Columbia University in New York City. He said, It's safe to say there is a pervasive worldwide threat directed to journalists, 
and I think that's very dangerous. Vijay Gupta is known to classical music lovers across the United States. Gupta serves as first violinist for the Los Angeles Philharmonic. In that job, he often plays to large crowds, including many very rich people. When he is not performing, he organizes concerts for homeless people. They have reminded me why I became a musician, he said. Last week, Gupta was recognized for being a founder and the artistic director of Street Symphony. The group has performed at homeless shelters, jails, and halfway houses for about eight years. Gupta is among the 25 winners of the 2018 MacArthur Fellowship, commonly known as the Genius Grant. Each winner will receive $625,000 over five years to use as they wish. The money is coming from a private group, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. It awards grants to people whose work it considers exceptional and that inspires hope in us all. Gupta said he got the idea for Street Symphony while teaching Nathaniel Ayers, a trained musician whose mental illness led to homelessness. Ayers' life was the basis for the movie The Soloist. I grew up around mental illness, Gupta said, noting that he has experienced it himself. The 31-year-old grant winner said he does not know yet how he will spend the money. He has been a performer since age seven, and the award will give him space to breathe, plan, and look ahead. Another winner is Rebecca Sandifer, an associate professor of sociology and law with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Sandifer said she was shocked to find out she had won a MacArthur Fellowship. The Associated Press says her research actively supports new ways to involve poor communities in the U.S. justice system. 47-year-old Sandifer created the first national mapping of civil legal aid providers. It shows which states had the financial resources to provide such aid and which did not. Sandifer said the award would be important in advancing her work. I'm Alice Bryant. Google has launched the latest versions of its Pixel smartphone as well as a new tablet computer and a smart home controller. The new products were announced during an event Tuesday in New York. Google launched the first Pixel smartphone two years ago as part of a major new effort to develop hardware. The company is better known for building software to power internet search technology 
and the Android smartphone operating system. Over the past two years, Google has sold about 7 million Pixel phones, the technology research company IDC estimates. Those sales are a very small part of the estimated 3.6 billion phones sold by all manufacturers during that same two-year period. Apple, for example, sold about 388 million iPhones during the two years. Google's new smartphones, the Pixel 3 and Pixel 3 XL, appear aimed at providing iPhone-like features at a lower price. The Pixel 3 will be available October 18th in the United States for $799. The larger Pixel 3 XL will cost $899. This compares to the iPhone XS, which sells for $999, and the iPhone XS Max, priced at $1,000. $99. Both new Pixels are also being released in 12 other countries, including Japan, Singapore, and India. During Tuesday's launch event, Google officials demonstrated new features and improvements to the Pixel 3. At times, they made direct comparisons to iPhones. Google promises better camera performance in its Pixel 3 devices. A new tool is designed to use machine learning software to produce better low-light and close-up shots. The tool works by combining many shots quickly taken one after the other. The camera also uses machine learning to examine the many photos it takes in an effort to find and suggest the best ones. Pixel 3 phones were also built with two camera lenses in front, which Google demonstrated as a helpful tool when taking selfies with large groups. The phone is also able to answer itself if the user cannot or does not want to pick up. If a call comes in, the user can touch the screen to have the phone answer and ask who is calling. The answer from the person placing the call is then put into a text message and shared with the user in real time. Google product manager Liza Ma said the feature puts the user in complete control of the phone. You can decide whether to pick up, send a quick reply, or mark the call as spam. You'll never have to talk to another telemarketer. As with the earlier models, the new Pixels center heavily on the company's search engine and other products. These include Maps, Google Assistant, and YouTube video service. Google also introduced its new Home Hub, an internet-connected smart speaker and home controller with a small screen. The device is similar to Amazon's Echo Show and Facebook's new Portal. The company said Home Hub is designed to be a central controller for many devices throughout the home, such as lights, outdoor cameras, temperature controls, and televisions. Like similar devices, it can be activated by voice to play music and look up information on the Internet. Home Hub will cost $149 when it goes on sale later this month in the United States, Britain, and Australia.
This compares to the new version of Amazon's Echo Show, which sells for $229. The cost of the Facebook portal starts at $199. Google also announced it would launch a new computer tablet later this year called the Pixel Slate. The company says the device will be powered by its own newly designed Chrome OS system. It appears aimed at competing with Apple's iPad Pro. The Slate will run Android phone apps, but Google says it offers performance closer to a desktop computer. I'm Brian Lin. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we will finish our story about Abraham Lincoln. He led the United States during the Civil War. That conflict lasted from 1861 to 1865. In it, the southern states of the Confederacy battled the northern states of the Union. As a wartime president, Lincoln was known for several things. He was actively involved in plotting the military campaign. When Lincoln was unhappy with the performance of his top generals, he dismissed them. He also greatly increased the power of the presidency, even beyond what the U.S. Constitution permitted. And Lincoln struck at the issue at the heart of the Civil War, slavery. He ordered that enslaved people in the Confederate States be forever free. His order is called the Emancipation Proclamation. Seven months after the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, the Confederacy and the Union clashed in the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. The Army of Confederate General Robert E. Lee was on the offensive. Lee planned to move the fighting out of the South and invade the North. He won a major victory against Union forces at Chancellorsville, Virginia. Then he pushed across Maryland and into Pennsylvania. A Union army, led by General George Meade, met Lee's troops near a small crossroads town called Gettysburg. In the first days of July 1863, a little more than two years after the start of the Civil War, Confederate and Union troops each struggled to claim the territory. Both sides suffered massive casualties, but Lee believed Confederate troops were close to winning and that Meade had spread his soldiers thin. So, on the third day of fighting, he ordered a direct attack on Union forces. Lee's soldiers aimed at the center of the Union line, positioned behind stone walls at the top of a ridge or raised area. Confederates first used cannons to fire artillery at the ridge. Then about 15,000 Confederate soldiers began marching across more than a kilometer of an open field. The Union soldiers behind the walls fired on them. More Union forces attacked the Confederate soldiers on the left and right. In half an hour, three-quarters of the soldiers in the open field had been killed or wounded. Thousands more on each side also died. The surviving Confederate forces quickly withdrew and waited for Meade to attack again. But, much to Lincoln's dissatisfaction, he did not. The following morning, Lee led the survivors back to Virginia. He left behind 28,000 soldiers dead, wounded, 
or missing, more than one-third of his total army. The Union had suffered 23,000 casualties, almost as many. The Battle of Gettysburg is important in American history for several reasons. One is the large number of killed and wounded soldiers, the largest until World War II in the 20th century. Another reason is because it was a turning point in the war. It ended Lee's invasion of the North and weakened his army permanently. Over the same days, Union troops won another major victory under General Ulysses S. Grant in the southern city of Vicksburg, Mississippi. The battles at Vicksburg and Gettysburg began to turn the conflict to the Union's favor. Finally, the Battle of Gettysburg is almost always linked to a speech Lincoln gave there, known as the Gettysburg Address. It is only about 270 words long, but it is one of the most famous speeches in American history. Lincoln spoke at the opening of a cemetery for all the soldiers who had died at Gettysburg, but he also used the event to speak to the entire country about the war. He said, the conflict was a test of whether the American form of government could survive, that is, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. He also pointed to the Declaration of Independence as the country's founding document. He said, the nation had been conceived in liberty, and, he said, it was dedicated to the idea that all men are created equal. Historians have noted that, in the speech, Lincoln changed the reasoning behind the war effort. It continued to be a struggle to reunite the country. But after the Gettysburg Address, it was also more clearly a struggle to free enslaved people. In 1864, Lincoln won re-election to a second term as president. His new vice president was Senator Andrew Johnson from the southern state of Tennessee. At the swearing-in ceremony, the president spoke about the need for the North and South to come together again peacefully. In that speech, his famous second inaugural, Lincoln called on all Americans to finish the war. He urged them to care for the wounded, the wives and children of soldiers killed in battle, and to seek a just and lasting peace. Most importantly, Lincoln asked Americans to reunite with malice toward none, with charity for all. In other words, with respect and kindness. A few weeks later, the war effectively ended. Lincoln's military plan had worked. He had finally found two generals whom he trusted, Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. Sherman led a campaign across the southern states. His path through Georgia, from the city of Atlanta to the city of Savannah, was known as Sherman's March to the Sea. The march destroyed farms and houses along the way. The destruction was terrible. It was also effective. The Confederate Army was left with little food or communication. At the same time, Grant surrounded Lee's army in Virginia. Grant cut these Southern troops off from supplies, too. Lee realized he must surrender to Grant, although, he said, he would rather die a thousand deaths. The two men met on April 9, 1865, at a farmhouse in the town of Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. 
Lee famously wore his finest military uniform and sword. Grant famously wore his fighting clothes, still marked with mud. Lee and Grant spoke briefly. Then Grant wrote the terms of surrender. As Lincoln had asked, the terms were respectful and generous. Lee's officers were free to keep their horses and their weapons, and the Union Army would give the Confederate soldiers food. When some Union troops began to play a victory song, Grant told them to stop. The war is over, he said. The rebels are our countrymen again. Five days after Lee surrendered, Lincoln and his wife, Mary, went to a theater in Washington, D.C. To put it mildly, the last years had been very difficult for them. While Lincoln was supervising the war effort, both his third and fourth son became sick with typhoid. The younger boy recovered. The older did not. Willie Lincoln died in the White House at age 11. Mary and Abraham Lincoln were crushed. Mary Lincoln blamed herself. She believed God was punishing her. In their own ways, the Lincolns continued to mourn in the years after Willie's death. At one point, Lincoln said he hoped he and Mary could feel happier. He urged them to have some pleasant times together. So, with the war coming to an end, they went to a light-hearted play at Ford's Theater. It was the night of Friday, April 14, 1865, a day that Christians were marking that year as Good Friday, the anniversary of Jesus' death. The theater was not far from the White House. The Lincolns had seats in a box high above the stage. Toward the end of the performance, a man entered their box and shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. Then the gunman jumped to the stage, breaking his leg as he landed. He called out a Latin expression, sic semper tyrannis. It means, thus always to tyrants. Some observers say, the man added, the South is avenged. The gunman was a Southerner named John Wilkes Booth. He had plotted to kill the president after hearing Lincoln support voting rights for African Americans. Booth briefly escaped, but was later captured and hanged. Lincoln was taken to a nearby boarding house. He seemed lifeless and could hardly breathe. Doctors examined him, but found they could not save him. Lincoln died the following morning. He was 56 years old. The emotions of many Americans changed from joy at the coming end of the Civil War to shock and mourning. Thousands lined up along railroad tracks as Lincoln's body made its way from Washington, D.C. to his home in Illinois. Even many Southerners mourned Lincoln's death. They understood that he would treat them kindly. A little more than six weeks after Lincoln's assassination, the last Confederate army surrendered, and the war was considered officially over. The country was reunited, and the process of legally freeing enslaved people had begun. Although these acts are tremendous parts of Lincoln's legacy, in time his public image would grow only larger and more celebrated. As one witness to Lincoln's death reportedly said, now he belongs to the ages. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.